The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Okay, so um, now we can uh, continue pretty much where we left off yesterday. Uh, and uh, yesterday we were talking about meditation practice uh, and we were talking about the importance of gaining that joy and happiness in meditation and how this is emphasized in the suttas. Uh, and uh, I was pointing out that to be able to get that joy, the foundation uh, that makes everything happen in the meditation practice uh, is sila. If sila is uh, strongly based and strongly founded, uh, uh, the morality, the good conduct, the good habits, uh, all these positive things, uh, the good character, if you like, uh, having a good heart, it can be summarized maybe as that. Uh, if the more strong that is, uh, uh, the more powerful the meditation practice is going to be as a result of that. Uh, so today I want to focus a bit on how to uh, make that foundation really strong. Uh, so it's going to be an emphasis on metta practice and in a very broad sense, uh, not just as a meditation object, but as a way of life and how to live uh, as a person with metta. Because uh, sometimes I think we uh, get it wrong, or maybe not we, but occasionally people get it wrong and uh, uh, they think that metta is something that is mainly done in meditation practice. Uh, but actually, when you read the word of the Buddha carefully, it is something that you do all the time. Uh, a meditation practice of metta really only becomes possible uh, once you uh, fulfill metta in all of your other daily activities. Uh, so I will have a look at a sutta, first of all, called the Kosambia Sutta. It's from the uh, middle-length sayings of the Buddha, number 48. And uh, it's quite an interesting sutta. Uh, the kind of the background story to this sutta is what is the famous incident in the uh, early Sangha of the Buddha called the Quarrel at Kosambi. Yeah, so you can see how the quarrel at Kosambi doesn't sound very promising. But of course, <laughs> once you have a quarrel, then from that it becomes natural for the Buddha to talk about metta, because that is kind of the anti-quarrel, yeah, the way to kind of overcome arguments and problems and all of these kind of things. And uh, f fascinating that this quarrel at Kosambi, uh, uh, there were the monks, they were arguing about some kind of tiny point of vinaya, uh, yeah, some kind of small point. Uh, it's always the small points that leads to the biggest arguments. Uh, isn't that right? Uh, it's kind of strange, the tiny things that don't really matter. Uh, they kind of lead to some kind of crazy argument about things. Uh. And so the monks were arguing about this tiny point, uh, and then the Buddha says, don't argue. Yeah, This is not the path uh, of... Uh, kind of that leads to happiness and leads to contentment and leads to all good things. Uh, leave the arguments alone. Uh, and then uh, the monks, they say to the Buddha, oh, just let it be. Uh, uh, just uh, go and enjoy yourself in meditation. We will, you know, we will look after this argument. We will look after this. Uh. So in a way, very disrespectful. Imagine having the kind of the greatest spiritual master in human history. Uh, he is before you and you kind of tell him, okay, yeah, just, go, just go away. We will sort of sort this out. Uh. It's terrible, isn't it? And uh, this, so this is uh, this is what uh, seems to have happened. And of course, the Buddha is not all that impressed uh, with what is going on. Uh, so the Buddha he uh, uh, decides to just leave because when people don't listen to you, there's not much point in kind of hanging around. Uh, and then sometimes when you leave, people come to their senses because they realize that actually they depend on the Buddha for the Dhamma for the all of these good things, and without the Buddha, it just isn't the same anymore. You can't sustain that thing without the Buddha. Even today, after two and a half thousand years, uh, we rely on the Buddha to get these teachings to us. Uh. So then just as the Buddha is about to leave, he says these famous verses. Uh, these verses are found in the Dhammapada as well, uh, very beautiful verses uh, that he says just as he's about to leave the Sangha and kind of uh, head out to the forest. Uh, and by the way, the forest that he goes to is the Parileyaka forest, which I'm sure you may have heard about. It's a kind of very well-known forest and well-known story. The story is, is taught in many different ways. And uh, but the most famous one that people usually know about is not the one in the suttas, but the one in the commentaries. Uh, it's always like that. Uh, commentary stories are always more famous than the sutta stories. Uh, and the one in the commentaries is the one about the elephant and the monkey. Uh, you know that story about the elephant and the monkey? Uh, yeah, very famous story. Uh, the elephant and the monkey looking after the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha staying in the Parulaika forest. Uh, 
in the Sutta or in the Vinaya Pitaka, there's only an elephant. So as soon as, if you know the story version with a monkey in it, it means that you know the commaterial version of the story. Yeah. And usually that's what people know, that story, because it is more elaborate. Because it's more elaborate, it's more interesting. Yeah. It's more useful for telling stories. Yeah. And if you have grown up in a Buddhist culture, uh, usually uh, or you're part of a Buddhist culture, you will have heard these kind of stories uh, in the more elaborate versions. Uh. Is found in the Dhammapada Atakata, the commentary on the Dhammapada. You have this long version of the story here. Uh, the one in the Vinaya is shorter. There's no monkey, just an elephant. Uh, that's, the dif- that's one of the main differences. Uh. Not that it really matters that much, uh, but uh, it just shows you where we get most of our knowledge of Buddhism from. Uh, usually comes, uh, tends to come from the commentaries. Uh. It's that's a very uh, kind of prevalent uh, thing in the Buddhist world. Uh. But let me read out those beautiful uh, verses from the Dhammapada, which are also found in this uh, Upakilesa Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, because they're very nice verses, uh, and I thought I might as well. Uh, and they also have to do with metta uh, at the same time. Uh, and these are verses that uh, you, no doubt many of you will have heard before. Uh. So then after the Buddha has uh, uh, kind of uh, kind of given up on the monks, at least temporarily, uh, and he's about to remove himself uh, uh, he says a couple of verses, and then comes the famous ones. Uh, he abused me, he struck me, he defeated me, he robbed me. Uh, in those who harbor thoughts like these, uh, hatred will never be allayed. Uh, he abused me, he struck me, he defeated me, he robbed me. Uh, in those who do not harbor thoughts like these, uh, hatred will readily be allayed. Uh, for in this world, hatred is never allayed by further acts of hate. Uh, it is allayed by non-hatred. Uh, this is a fixed uh, and ageless law. If one can find a worthy friend, a virtuous, steadfast companion, uh, then overcome all threats of danger uh, and walk with him content and mindful. Uh. But if one finds no worthy friend and no virtuous, steadfast companion, uh, then as a king leaves his conquered realm, uh, walk like a tusker in the woods alone. Uh. Better it is to walk alone, there is no company with fools. Walk alone and do no evil, at ease like a tusker in the woods. So very beautiful verses found in the Dhammapada, and sometimes I recommend people to have a book like the Dhammapada on their bedside, and you can just read a verse in there, and sometimes you fall asleep and you you kind of feel better just by reading a couple of verses like that uh, and reminding yourself of some of the basic things in Buddhism uh, about metta and thinking about things in the right way. uh. And uh, I'm not going to comment on these verses, you could comment a lot on them, uh, uh, except that here obviously the Buddha has had enough of the monks, uh, he's going to be like that tusker, tusker like a big elephant uh, 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 walking by himself in the woods. uh. So that is uh, that uh, story, and then uh, when the Buddha has said this, then he uh, leaves, uh, and he goes, uh, uh, first of all, he visits some monks, uh, and the monks that he visits after this are the monks Anuruddha, Kimbila, and Nandiya, and these are like the exemplary monks. Yeah, They are different from the Kosambian monks. Uh, they are practicing really well and doing all the right things, uh, and uh, then after visiting them, he goes off into the forest and he just hangs out with the elephant uh, and the elephant looks after him. Uh, it's all kind of, it's all very, all quite a nice little story. Uh. But uh, now what I want to do is continue. And uh, this is uh, now from the uh, Kosambia Sutta. And this is Sutta is uh, uh, number 48 of the Majjhima Nikaya. And this kind of picks up at this particular point, uh, either just before the Buddha uh, leaves the monks, or maybe just after he gets back to them later on, uh, and then he teaches them uh, these six principles of unity uh, that brings people to get, bring people together, bring societies together, make society more harmonious and unified. Uh, and this is what we are coming to uh, now. Uh. So, what are these six principles of unity and harmony? Uh? This is what this little extract is about. Uh. Uh, then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Uh, because there are these six principles of cordiality uh, that create love and respect uh, and conduce to cohesion, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. Uh, what are these six? 
Here, a bhikkhu maintains the bodily acts of loving-kindness uh, both in public and in private uh, towards his companions in the holy life. Uh, this is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect uh, and conduces to cohesion, to non-dispute, uh, to concord uh, and to unity. Uh. So here you have the basis of creating non-dispute uh, uh, it is not a, a kind of practicing metta in the way that we do in metta meditation, but actually it is about having uh, acts of loving kindness through the body and uh, and then later on speech and also through the mind eventually. Uh, so it starts uh, with doing things through bodily action. This is where it begins. Uh, this is where metta actually commences. Uh, and uh, this is such an important thing to remember that we start off with the simpler things, uh, to sit down and wish the whole universe uh, uh, you know, well-being and happiness is a wonderful thing to do, uh, but often it doesn't work. Often it doesn't have that power behind it. Uh, and the reason why it doesn't work is because we haven't actually put in the foundations yet uh, to make these things work. Uh, and this is part of the problem. Uh, so first of all, we need to put in the foundation stones, and that is uh, acting with metta through body. Uh, and of course, that is a practice for daily life, uh, how we treat the people around us, uh, whether we treat them with kindness, uh, whether we have that ability to just do little things and say little things uh, that make the atmosphere lighter and more positive uh, and people feel good about themselves as a consequence. Uh, this is where it all starts. Yeah, Start with the basics. Don't start with the complicated things. Uh, and we often forget that. Uh, and if you look at the opportunities in daily life to do acts of kindness to the people around you, uh, there are so many opportunities. Uh, yeah, there are so many chances that we kind of uh, miss. Uh, but if we look out for them uh, and we kind of remember the importance of kindness, uh, we see so many opportunities to, to, uh, to do these kind of things. Uh. And uh, it is interesting because I sometimes, you know, I meet some very interesting monks in my monastic life, uh, and not just monks, but sometimes nuns and lay people. Uh, but uh, some of the most uh, impressive people that I have met have been other monks. Uh, and uh, uh, what is interesting about them is how down to earth they tend to be. Uh, in my experience, the more enlightened they are, the more kind of powerful they are, the more samadhi they have, uh, the more insight they have, uh, the more kind of uh, simple they are. Yeah, they're like kind of, they're so simple. They're kind of, there's nothing much to them at all. Uh, they kind of fade into the background. There's no ego. They have nothing to prove. They don't have to use fancy language or fancy ideas or be intellectual, anything like that. Uh, they're very down to earth and simple people. Uh. And uh, it's a good reminder that uh, too much uh, intellectualizing in Buddhism, it's okay to be a little bit intellectual and to study things, uh, but that, of course, is not really the point. Uh, it is there to support the other part of the practice. Uh, and I remember very well visiting one of these very famous teachers. He's, a, he's very famous in Thailand now, uh, and he's famous for all his uh, metta and kindness, uh, uh, Ajahn Ganha, who has also stayed at our monastery in Perth, uh, uh, for some uh, long periods, uh, and I was there with him, and he's, uh, he's like a magnet for people. Yeah, People come in, uh, and they sit around him. They don't really ask many questions of him. They don't really, he doesn't say very much either. He just sits there, uh, and he smiles, and then when he smiles, everyone is happy. Uh, yeah, that's how it works. Uh, you just kind of sit there, you kind of, you kind of receive his radiance, yeah, and then yeah, that's really all you have to do when you go to see Ajangana, and you kind of relax, and you feel at ease, uh, and everything feels very nice. Uh, and uh, then he says a few words, but he doesn't teach all that much. Uh, and uh, so you, uh, you go there to just to bathe in his radiance, which is kind of, uh, kind of cute and nice. Uh, but uh, then I asked him, you know, because I knew that he was very, and I could also feel that when you were there. So I asked him, uh, um, how, you know, how do you practice metta? Because, you know, just to get some kind of input from someone who obviously is so proficient in these kind of things. Uh, and I thought, I had no idea what he was going to say. I thought maybe he said, oh, sit down and spread out metta to all living beings. But of course, he didn't say that. Uh, he said something much more simple. Uh, he said to me that uh, uh, when you wake up in the morning, uh, you should ask yourself, what good can I do for the world today? Uh, so such a simple teaching. Uh, what can I do? How can I help out? How can I be of, of help and aid to my fellows in the world, to, my, to the people around me? Uh, that is the foundation for metta practice. Uh, and once you get that right, then the other things tend to come as a consequence. Once you practice deliberately to be kind to others, then you're kind of dragging your mind along with it, because your mind has to 
look at the good qualities, at the positive sides of other people, uh, to be able to do acts of kindness. Uh, yeah, so your mind kind of follows along, uh, and you start to see people in a better way, and then the ball gets rolling, uh, and you start to, and all of this starts to kind of work out. And then eventually, when you sit down in meditation and you wish all beings well, it becomes really powerful. Uh, yeah, I mean, for some of you, you may already have some success with the metta meditation, but it becomes even more powerful uh, if you integrate it fully in this way, in the way you live. Uh. And of course, the more you are able to do this also in your meditation, and it feeds back again into the way you live as well uh, from that. Uh. And it is uh, astonishing how powerful this such metta can be. And uh, there's many stories about Ajahn Ganha, about his metta, and some of those stories I I sometimes you wonder whether to fully believe them or not. Stories are always a little bit unreliable, so you never know 100% how much to believe. But some of the stories are are over the top. There's a famous story with Ajangana patting the king cobra on the head. I'm sure you've probably heard of that story. And it's kind of astonishing. How can you pat the king cobra on the head? Yeah, nice king cobra, okay. <laughs> it's kind of remarkable. But another story, which is maybe even more remarkable, I, to I told this story at the retreat, this is a really remarkable story. Patting King Cobra is nothing compared to this. And this was Ajahn Ganaha was visiting us in Perth. By the way, we have, uh, Ajahn Brahm has a very close relationship with Ajahn Ganaha. So when I went to uh, visit Ajahn Ganaha in his monastery in Thailand, he received me very, very well, yeah, because uh, probably because I was a disciple of Ajahn Brahm. And he kind of put aside lots of time for me here. Yeah. So the, the trick, if you ever want to go to Thailand, you want to visit some of these monks and they are friends with Ajahn Brahm, the trick is always to say, yeah, I'm a Ajahn, also an Ajahn Brahm disciple. Yeah? Yeah. And then you get extra, extra kind of, uh, be looked after extra well. Uh, this is a secret, by the way, don't tell it to too many, otherwise it doesn't work anymore. Uh. <laughs> so Ajahn Ganha, he was in Perth. Uh, and uh, at that time, this was back in the kind of late, mid to late 80s, uh, when the building program in Perth was kind of going on to the, to the, like the very full steam because there was nothing. When we started out in Perth, actually it was before my time, uh, when Ajahn Brahm started out, there was just an empty property. Uh, they had a shearer's shed, I think. Uh, Australia is famous for its shearer's sheds. That's kind of shearer's sheds on rural properties, very common, uh, to shear the sheep. That was, it used to be a sheep property. Uh, that's pretty much all they had. Uh, and um, so they had to build up everything, and they were very dependent on good relationships with the local council, uh, with the local mayor, uh, yeah, especially. Uh, and uh, so they were kind of very concerned about this because they needed all the licenses and all of these kind of things. And the mayor at that time, he was one of the big farmers in that area. Uh, and in those days, if you were the big farmer and you were the mayor, you were like the most important part in that rural community. Uh, yeah, rural communities were often kind of led by kind of strong personalities that were uh, in charge of things. Uh, and this is what happened uh, in this case. Uh, so uh, uh, Ajahn Ganha was in the monastery, uh, and one day this mayor walks into the monastery. Yeah, he's kind of a friendly mayor, walks around, uh, and he's a big Australian with a big belly. Yeah, really, really big belly. Uh, and as soon as he walks into the monastery, Ajahn Ganha gets sight of him. He sees him, and he sees this belly, and he's very impressed by this big Australian belly. Uh, so uh, he, Ajahn Ganha sees him, and before Ajahn Brahm has a chance to intervene, uh, yeah, because Ajahn Brahm is not kind of quick enough off the mark, uh, then Ajahn Ganha goes up to this mayor and he looks at this belly, yes, looks at the belly, and he takes out his hand and starts patting him on the belly. <laughs> oh, patting someone on the belly is not the kind of the done thing in Australia, probably not the done thing anywhere, yeah, but you know, you, you can't do that to people. And Ajahn Brahm says, oh no, <laughs> all our building licenses, everything is now going to be on hold, it's not going to happen anymore, we have destroyed the relationship with the local council once and for all. You cannot go around patting people on the belly. Imagine if you, in Melbourne, you saw someone on the street with a big belly and you went up to them and started patting them on the belly. It wouldn't work, right? It would be really, really bad news. Uh, but the amazing thing, and this is what I mean by astonishing powers of kindness, is that instead of the mayor feeling offended or getting upset or, or whatever, uh, he just started smiling and he started kind of uh, giggling and kind of laughing, yeah, uh, and kind of gurgling. I think Ajahn Ram used the word gurgling when he explained what was going on. Uh, and he was so happy, yeah, because he was in the presence of obviously a degree of kindness, a degree of metta, a degree of... Uh, 
of non-judgment uh, that is very, very hard to find in the world. Uh, and he probably just felt at ease. He felt relaxed. Yeah. And then after that, Ajahn Ram said, no problem anymore with any kind of application for building. Everything went st through straight away uh, because he had a good connection with the, with the council from that time on. Uh, it's astonishing. Yeah? Yeah. When you have certain qualities, uh, when you develop certain qualities to the a very high level. You can do things that nobody else can do, huh? and you can get away with it. Uh, maybe get away is the wrong word. You can do it, and it actually has a positive effect. Uh, and this is kind of one of the qualities of, uh, uh, you know, of someone who has developed themselves to such a high level. That's what I mean. This is even more superpower than patting the king cobra on the head. Yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, going and kind of just patting people on the stomach and then kind of getting everything through the council afterwards is kind of uh, astonishing. Yeah. So this idea that there is no corruption in Australia, that's completely wrong. Yeah? You just, the way you corrupt is by patting people on the tummy, and then you get everything through. Yeah? <laughs> Even monks, yeah, we're kind of using, using dodgy means to get things sorted out. Yeah? So this is uh, Ajahn Ganha, but uh, for me the most powerful thing was just how simple, uh, simple way he explained the idea of metta. Start out with your physical and bodily actions. Uh, and as you do that, uh, things just happen and they kind of start. The ball gets rolling as a consequence of that. Uh, and this is exactly what the Buddha is saying here as well. The first thing, remember, one of the points I always make about the suttas, uh, and this important point that I think you should also remind yourself uh, when you read the suttas for yourself, they are always structured. Uh, yeah, there is no such thing as a list of factors that are randomly put together. There is a reason why they have that particular sequence. Everything is put in sequence. The Buddha is incredibly systematic. Svakato Bhagavat, Bhagavata Dhammo. Svakato means well expounded. Su Akato, well expounded, is the Dhamma of the Blessed One. Yeah, and so for this reason, when the bodily actions come first, uh, it means that that is what we should develop first. Uh, that is the foundation stone uh, for all the other things to happen. Uh. And then, of course, it says also very nicely that uh, when you do this, you should do it both in private and in public. Uh, so you don't have, you're not kind of two-faced, yeah, you're kind of hypocritical in public, you're all nice and behind people's backs, you kind of say and do all kind of dodgy things. You have integrity in the way you practice. You're always kinder. When you go back to your room, you still have that sense of kindness and you kind of allow it to permeate your whole life. And one of the interesting things about this as well, which I always kind of struck me as a particularly um, unique, is not, maybe not unique, but special, is that he says that you should have this metta towards your fellows in the monastic life. And uh, you may wonder, does that mean that monastics should have no uh, metta towards the lay people? We should just disregard the lay people and treat them, treat them really harshly? Is that what it means? Uh, and of course, it does not mean that at all. Uh, that is not what it means. Uh, but the point, rather, is that as a monastic, uh, yeah, your family is basically your fellow monastics. Uh, and if you are able to have metta towards the people who are closest to you, uh, yeah, like in family life, the people you're closest to you can often be the people it is most difficult to have consistent metta towards. Why? Because they rub up against you. They're always around. They irritate you and all these kind of things. And it's exactly the same thing in monastic life. When you are around people all the time, that is where you have to put in the effort. It's interesting. And then, you know, with lay people, it's much easier to have metta because I only see you guys once a year. I come to Melbourne once a year, yeah? It's easier to be nice for a few days. Then I can kind of, after I can, I made it. Yeah, I was nice for a few days. <laughs> Go back to Perth again. It's easy. Yeah. So it's much easier. Yeah. But people who are close to you all the time, that is where the hard practice is. Yeah. So remember that. When you uh, we talk about metta, remember to bring it into those situations where it is often the most difficult, where you have very strong habits. Uh, and those habits are the people who are closest to you, who you deal with all the time, a, a family life, maybe at work as well, uh, or maybe people you have known here in the Buddhist society for a long, long time. Yeah, Similar problems can arise. Uh, that is often where the most difficult work has to be put in. And if you can do it there, you can do it everywhere. Yeah, then it really becomes, you can kind of expand out. and Everyone uh, can become accepted uh, uh, because uh, uh, then the foundation is in place. So, so that is the, uh, the bodily actions. And um, then uh, uh, the um, uh, Buddha says, the next one, he says then, uh, Again, a bhikkhu maintains verbal acts of loving-kindness, both in public and in private, uh, 
towards his companions in the holy life. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to unity. So uh, uh, you act, have acts of verbal acts of loving kindness uh, and uh, a, a little bit more difficult than bodily acts because uh, the, the kind of the mouth moves so fast uh, and before you know it things have kind of got out of your mouth that weren't supposed to get out of your mouth. Uh, so you have to have a bit more mindfulness and that's why it is a bit more difficult. Uh, but uh, Obviously, it is very important, and one of the ways that I like to think about speech, the Buddha talks about speech, right speech, quite a bit uh, in connection with the Noble Eightfold Path and the gradual training and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, remember that speech can be a gift uh, to the people around you. Uh, gifts are not just uh, kind of the acts that we do or the generosity that we do, uh, but actually when you speak to someone in a nice way, uh, you're giving them a gift. Uh, because hearing words that are well spoken, uh, hearing words that are gentle and kind, that create harmony and create unity, uh, it is pleasant. Uh, you feel good about that. Uh, you feel happy when you hear good speech. Uh, so remember, you have the chance, every time you open your mouth, uh, you have a chance either to give someone a gift uh, of right speech, uh, or to ha have a chance to kind of subtract from their uh, quality of their life by saying something negative. Uh, don't subtract from other people's quality of life. Uh, improve the quality. Uh, that is metta in action uh, from a speech point of view. Uh, and the way the, the Buddha talks about uh, right speech in the suttas is actually very interesting. He, uh, first of all, of course, the worst kind of speech is lying. Uh, yeah, Again, it is, remember the four kinds of wrong speech? Yeah, Lying, then you have divisive speech, harsh speech, and then you have idle chatter at the bottom. Uh, the worst one of those is lying. Yeah? And that's pretty obvious, yeah, that yeah, uh, you can't lie and that the, if you lie then there is no loving kindness there because uh, uh, you are creating problems, you are distorting other people's understanding of reality and all of these kind of things. Uh. So that's kind of clear enough. But then you have the next one is divisive speech. Uh, yeah, and the Buddha says, actually let me read out this uh, little passage because they're very nice and I happen to have the Majjhima here anyway. I should always carry the Majjhima with me so I can just open it up at any time and just read out some of these beautiful passages. So um, um, this is how he, how he talks about a divisive speech, yeah? abandoning a divisive speech. You abstain from divisive speech. You do not repeat elsewhere what you have heard here in order to divide those people from these. Uh, nor does he repeat uh, to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Uh, thus you are one who reunites those who are divided. Uh, you are a promoter of friendship. Uh, one who enjoys concord uh, or harmony, rejoices in harmony, delights in harmony. Uh, a speaker of words that promote harmony. Uh. Isn't that kind of, isn't that beautiful? Uh? Isn't that a wonderful little passage? You, you, you deliberately try to kind of create harmony with your speech uh, and you kind of bring people together instead of having more divisions in the world. We have too many divisions in this world already. Uh, at least we can have some people uh, who practice the Buddhist path correctly and bring people together instead. Uh. And very often, the way to do this very often is simply to try to understand another person's point of view. Uh, to understand that even if you can't understand them, to know that there are always different ways of seeing things. Uh, you may not be able to grasp what the other person is thinking, uh, but that doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, and that by trying to understand, by trying to um, uh, broaden out your own scope and views, then you actually can create this harmony. Remind people uh, that uh, there are different ways of looking at things in the world uh, and then uh, accept that, that there are is always going to be differences. Uh. And this is kind of one of the foundations of harmony, is not to always agree with each other, because we're not always going to agree, uh, but to be able to disagree in a harmonious way. That is really the critical thing. Uh. Not to hold your views too tightly, uh, yeah? or even if you hold them, not to kind of hold them in such a way that you are attached uh, and you start arguing and these kind of things, uh, but being able to let go. Uh, letting go, this is one of the classical places where letting go is so important. Uh, uh, so that you don't create this harmony in the community. Huh? It's very difficult. Yeah? Someone asked at the retreat how to, uh, how to work on a committee huh? yeah? in such a way that there is harmony. Huh? 
And uh, I don't know anyone who knows the answer to that one. I think it's almost impossible. Yeah, Committees are always prone to divisions and to disharmony. It's like, like that everywhere. Yeah? And uh, sometimes it doesn't seem to matter even if you have kind of an, an arahant on the committee. Still, you're going to argue. Still, el- the other people will argue. Yeah, And uh, this, just like here in the Kosambia Sutta, the Buddha was there. Still, they keep on arguing. Okay, please just, you know. Buddha, please just go and live and be at ease, and we will kind of argue this out among ourselves. <laughs> it's terrible, isn't it? That's kind of how we are. We kind of become so obsessed with these views and these ideas, uh, we can't see sense after, uh, after a while. Uh. So remember the idea of harmony. Uh, yeah, Difficult, difficult one, but it is the second factor in right speech. Uh, it is the second most important one. Uh, after uh, uh, not lying comes the idea of harmonious speech. Uh. And then you have the... Um, the third factor of uh, uh, right speech, uh, and that is as follows, abandoning harsh speech. Uh, you abstain from harsh speech. Uh, you speak such words that are gentle, uh, pleasing to the ear, uh, lovable as go to the heart, uh, are courteous, desired by the many, uh, and agreeable to the many. Uh. Yeah, pe- words that go to the heart. People feel kind of glad when they hear you speak. Uh, people feel that they are kind of in good company. Uh, and uh, so again, it is like a gift. Yeah, when you give people these things, you're giving the, them the gift of your good speech. Uh, and people feel that they are receiving something beautiful. Uh. And the last one is to abandon gossip. So this is the least important one. Uh. And you abstain from gossip, you speak at the right time. What is fact? What is good? You speak on the Dhamma and the training. And you speak such words are worth recording. That's quite nice. Yeah, worth recording. Uh, To be treasured, in other words, that are reasonable, moderate. They don't go on forever. And they are beneficial. So there you are. That is the Buddha's uh, words on right speech from uh, from the gradual training. This is from the Chula Hatti Padropama Sutta, which perhaps many of you from with a Sri Lankan background will know, will know because this, that's the famous sutta with which Mahinda, Venerable Mahinda, came to Sri Lanka and he taught the royal, the king and the uh, the royal entourage. He taught taught this particular sutta, and they all became Buddhist as, on the basis of this sutta. So it's a very beautiful sutta. It's a simile for those of you who don't know. It's a simile, a uh, shorter simile of the elephant's footprint, uh, Majjhimanikai number 27 of the gradual training here. So that is the um, uh, the right speech factor, which you know, but I, I, it's just so lovely. Yeah, You know these things. You know what they are. It is, it's sometimes just to reread it and take it on board is so beautiful because it's so necessary to be reminded of these things, to strengthen that commitment to these things. Uh, so just rereading it kind of gives a sense of joy sometimes. Uh. So that is the, um, uh, the second factor here of, uh, uh, of right uh, speech, or of speaking with metta, rather. Uh, it is not just avoiding the bad speech, but actually deliberately talking the right speech, uh, the speech that has all of these qualities uh, that we were just uh, uh, looking at just now. Uh. And uh, then, uh, once the, uh, maybe what I should, one of the interesting points here, that um, one of the things that I was talking about during the uh, retreat was the problem of the sensual world. uh, Yeah, how the sensual world always lets you down uh, and why it is problematic. uh. And uh, the the metta here shows you one of the ways in which you can overcome some of the problems of the sensual world. uh. Of course, we all know that metta overcomes anger uh, because you cannot have metta and anger at the same time because they are polar opposites. Uh, so if you have metta, anger is kind of out of the way. Uh. But uh, metta also tends to overcome uh, sensuality to some extent. Uh, yeah, because, And the reason for that is because metta is such a pleasant feeling, it's such a nice thing to abide with these kind of feelings uh, that you become less interested by default in the sensual world. Uh, the sensual world doesn't really mean as much to you anymore. Uh, you may not be able to overcome the sensual world fully by metta. Actually, you can. If you take metta all the way to the jhanas, you can. Uh, but you certainly can reduce your attachment to that world uh, by practicing metta. And... Uh, uh, one of the um, uh, one of the interesting things that uh, kind of show one of the problems of the sensual world is one of these similes that you find in the uh, sutta called the Potalia Sutta that I read out on the retreat, uh, and this simile is the simile of uh, 
uh, a piece of meat is called. Uh, yeah, the piece of meat here is a uh, is a metaphor for the uh, sensual objects of the world, uh, and uh, this piece of meat gets a bird gets a piece of meat. Yeah, a bird very happy gets a piece of meat. Very hard for birds to come by pieces of meat. Uh, bird is very happy, so it flies off with this piece of meat. Uh, the problem is that if a bird gets hold of a piece of meat, uh, all the other birds want exactly the same piece of meat. Uh, so they come flying after it, uh, yeah, and they try to get hold of this piece of meat, uh, and they peck at this bird, and they try to kind of grab it out of its mouth, or out of its claws, or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, as the sutta says, because these other birds are many and maybe bigger than the other bird, uh, if that bird doesn't let go of that piece of meat quickly, uh, it will probably die as a consequence, or it will ha get some serious suffering, uh, because the other birds are very harsh and cruel. The animal realm is often very harsh and cruel in that sense. Uh, you fight, and often you fight to the death. Uh, and uh, this is a, such a beautiful simile for sensual pleasures, uh, because we're always, we, we fight over sensual pleasures in this world. Yeah, we fight over partners, we fight over promotions in our job, we fight over all kinds of things. We fight, at the end of the life, we fight over the inheritance from our uh, parents, uh, and we fight as children over toys or whatever. Uh, and always we are in competition with each other, and all of these things are related to sensual pleasures, to the sensual world. The pie, the economic pie, is only so large, and everyone always wants a larger share of that pie. There's no satiation, yeah? There's no kind of end point at which you say, okay, I'm satisfied now, I don't need anything more. That point never comes. You always want more, yeah? You can't get no satisfaction, as someone pointed out during the uh, retreat, yeah? The famous Rolling Stones song, yeah? And it's true, you can't really, I'm not sure what they meant by it, but... Uh, you know, that it's true. You can't really get satisfaction in that sensual world. And that is the problem. So the point about that, uh, because there is no satisfaction and because there always is going to be conflict over limited resources uh, and because we tend to desire the same thing, uh, it means that the sensual world is inherently filled with conflict. Uh, yeah, there has to be conflict in the sensual world. There's no such thing as a sensual world where we enjoy sensual pleasures and there is no conflict at all. And this is kind of off-putting. Yeah, a sensual world must, in the, at the end of the day, it will tend to lead to violence, to problems, to disagreements, to arguments. And it just has to be that way. It kind of, these things are conjoined with each other. So what this means, of course, in the context of what we are looking at now, if you are practicing metta, huh, you are reducing the anger, huh, but also you are reducing your uh, interest in that sensual world because all that conflict, all of those problems that come with that uh, actually no longer uh, kind of applies to you if you develop the metta deep enough. Huh. So you are able to let go of the sensory world uh, and that becomes far less of a problem for you. Huh. And this is one of the great benefits of practicing metta as well. Huh. So just to keep that in mind, yeah? And uh, it's useful to remember the problems of the sensory, sensory world, maybe sensory is better than sensual. It's useful to remember the problems in that world because when you do that, uh, you turn your mind a little bit away from the uh, worldly existence uh, towards the spiritual path. Uh, and to me, it is extraordinarily off-putting uh, uh, of the sensory world that it always has to lead to conflict, uh, always ends up with violence in that world. It is impossible to avoid that entirely. We can maybe reduce it through having uh, good institutions and a d decent society, uh, but it can never overcome it uh, because uh, it is uh, inherently part of that existence. Uh, ill will and sensual desire always go together. Uh. Okay, so let us um, have a look at the next one here. Uh. Again, a bhikkhu maintains mental acts of loving-kindness, both in public and in private, uh, towards his companions in the holy life. Uh, this, too, is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect uh, and conduces to unity. Uh. So this is the next step. So once you have your acts and your verbal speech reasonably well in shape, uh, yeah, then you go straight to the mind itself and you start changing your mind and you start to have metta, loving kindness towards people. You think about them with metta. Yeah? You, you, you think kind thoughts about the people around you. 
you see their good qualities, you focus on the good qualities, and this is how you can always have metta towards the majority of people around you, because you realize people are complicated, they have bad qualities, they have good qualities, and you deliberately look at the good ones to give rise to a sense of metta. This is uh, the... uh, uh, this is the um, uh, message of a sutta called the uh, Agata Pativinya Sutta, found in the uh, Anguttara Numerical Discourse number 563, I think it is, something like that, which I also read out on this retreat, which I read out on every single retreat, uh, because such an incredibly useful sutta, how to overcome anger and ill will. Uh, focus on the good qualities in the people around you. Uh, and that's quite easy, yeah, in a place like the BSV, where people come with good intentions, uh, wanting to do good things, uh, Just remember those good qualities. They are there. People want to do what is right. uh, And what a wonderful thing that is. Uh, Remember that. Don't remember the small little irritations that have to be there as well, because that's really irrelevant. Uh, What matters is the big picture. uh, And the big picture is beautiful. uh, Yeah, it is very promising. uh, It is this feeling of moving towards something positive together. uh. So this is how you then gradually learn to develop your mind in positive qualities, seeing the good in other people. And if if you can't see anything good in other people, uh, then have compassion for them because they are worthy of compassion. Uh, I spoke about that quite a bit before, so I'm going to leave that out. And in this way, you develop your mind in uh, thinking about people with kindness, uh, and if not kindness, then compassion. uh. And... um, uh, of course, uh, this is the hardest part of all, because the mind is even faster than speech. Uh, but uh, this is very, very worthwhile, because this uh, becomes one of the most important factors uh, for meditation practice to work. Uh, if you have a general positive outlook uh, towards people around you, uh, either compassion or metta, uh, it means that when you sit down, you will already have the starting point will already be there. Uh, and now when you watch the breath, everything will be so smooth and easy. Uh, because at this point, you really have purified your virtue. When we talk about purifying your virtue, that sila we talked about yesterday, which stands at the beginning of the entire path of meditation, uh, that is what it means. When your mind falls into place and your mental conduct becomes purified, uh, then sila is really purified. Uh, at that point, this whole non-regret, uh, and then pamuja, the gladness of the mind, the piti, the rapture, the pasadi, the tranquility, the sukha, the happiness, the samadhi, the stillness, the yatabhut and anadasana, seeing things according to reality, all of that just takes off uh, and it happens. And then it really does become an automatic process. Uh, all you have to do is lean back, yeah, and when you lean back, you just wait for the mind to calm down a little bit, get rid of the tiredness of the ordinary life and the uh, kind of the junk in the mind that accumulates because of all the things we do. And as the junk dies down, all these qualities start to emerge because you have built them up. They are just under the surface, waiting to emerge when you have a little bit of time to calm down and find that ease. It's wonderful, isn't it? It's such a beautiful thing. There's a beautiful simile in... uh, one of the suttas, this is a sutta, this is the Bala Pandita Sutta, the wise, the fools and the wise people. And in that uh, simile in the sutta, which I also often read out on these retreats, uh, uh, in that simile, the Buddha says that uh, the good person who really is good, yeah, it is, uh, it is like uh, uh, the simile, it is like a house in the evening. Yeah? Uh, in a house is standing on the side of the mountain. Yeah? And when in the evening the sun goes down behind the mountain, uh, then the shade of that mountain envelops, fully envelops that house, uh, completely surrounds it. Uh, There's no part of that house uh, which isn't covered by that shade. In the same way, when a good person comes back home after a long day's work uh, and you sit down and you lie down, uh, yeah, uh, after you kind of get a chance to relax and kind of be at ease, uh, the goodness of your character envelops you uh, and surrounds you completely. Uh, and then you feel happy and you feel good about yourself as a consequence. Uh, why? Because all there is, all you have is all these good actions uh, and they envelop you. Yeah, you are, th- this is what you are. Uh, this is your character. Uh, and it comes out in this way. Uh. So you have no choice. Uh, you have to be happy. Even if you don't want to be happy, no choice. You must be happy at this particular stage. Uh. It's good, isn't it? Uh, it's... <laughs> So that is uh, kind of the idea behind this. So these are the three 
main parts of developing loving kindness yeah outside of meditation practice and of course if you are able to do this at all times yeah continuously at all times uh, i was saying yesterday the idea that uh, someone was asking what should i do to end rebirth and i i answered uh, a little bit simplistically perhaps but still validly enough that all you have to do is to be kind at all times uh, and this way you will kind of advance on the path and this is really what this is about this is a more of a detailed explanation of that short answer i gave yesterday here so there are more aspects to this uh, uh, to these six principles, I only uh, read out three so far, uh, and maybe we can quickly go out the three other, uh, go through the three other ones as well, even though they're not quite as uh, uh, kind of applicable to what we are talking about. Nevertheless, they are very nice, and and uh, uh, I think it's worthwhile just consider them briefly at least. Uh, so that number four is as follows. Uh, again. Uh, a bhikkhu uses things in common with his virtuous companions in the holy life uh, without making reservations. Uh, he shares with them any gain of, of a kind that accords with the Dhamma and has been obtained in a way that accords with the Dhamma, including even the mere contents of his bowl, his arms bowl. Uh, this too is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to all of these good qualities. Uh, uh, what is that? Cohesion, non-dispute, concord, and unity. Yeah. So this is the idea of uh, uh, generosity yeah, and the power of generosity to create uh, harmony in the community. Yeah. And I mentioned this yesterday as well. Yeah. When we are kind to each other, when we are generous to each other, yeah, we tend to become very dear to each other. Yeah. Because when someone gives you something with a kind heart, you, it kind of feels very nice. Yeah also feels very nice to be the one who gives. Actually, it feels even nicer to be the one who gives often. So both of those things create harmony in the community. And I mentioned yesterday that the, there's a four uh, sangaha vat, vattu. Sangaha means like uh, getting people together. Yeah, These are the bases or foundations for getting people together in harmony. And one of those bases is generosity. Yeah, The four bases of kind of creating cohesion. Yeah, in the Sutta in particular, there was a, this man called Hattaka of Alavi, a very famous layman at the time of the Buddha. And he had this big entourage of 500 people that would go with him everywhere. And then the Buddha explained how you get that kind of entourage. Do you want that kind of entourage? Maybe not. Yeah? If, if you don't want this kind of entourage, don't practice these things because then you... <laughs> but it's okay if you are... If you have a lot of metta, you don't mind so much having an entourage. You, I, you probably don't care one way or the other, but it's kind of, okay, whatever happens. Uh, and so one of these ways of having a large entourage is to have, have metta, yeah, lots of metta. And then you become like Ajahn Ganha, and you sit there, and people just flock to his monastery, and they just sit in his presence, and they kind of follow after him. Yeah, When he goes red, right, you go right. When he goes left, you go left. Uh, when he travels, there's always lots of people traveling with him. Uh, yeah, This is how it goes. Uh, uh, so... Uh, so Generosity is one of those. A pleasing speech is another one. Yeah, uh, Doing a good turn, like in other words, just helping people is the third one. And equal treatment is the fourth one. You treat people equally. You don't have preferences. You don't have your favorites. Once you have favorites, there is a problem. So you should treat everyone roughly the same. These are the four bases of bringing people together. Anyway, generosity is one of those. Don't underestimate the power of generosity. As it says here, uh, you, you, as a bhikkhu, you share even the content of your alms bowl. It means you take every possible opportunity, if you can, to share what you have with others. And uh, that is kind of what this is uh, about. And one of the qualities it has here is this idea of doing it without reservation. Yeah, you don't hold back. You allow, you, you, you try to have an open heart, uh, being willing to share with everyone around you. This openness of heart is such a beautiful quality. When sometimes you may feel this, your heart kind of opens up uh, and you want to be generous to the whole world. Uh, and when you feel that, you know that generosity is a very spiritual quality uh, because it is a very delightful, it is very right, it is free of hindrances, free of this stinginess and egotism. Uh, being stingy is the opposite of generosity. Yeah, this is mine. Keep your hands away from my things. Uh, yeah, that's the exact opposite. Uh, and then willing to share out is the uh, opposite of that. Uh, 
And the Buddha says, if you want to enter a deep state of samadhi, if you want to attain a deep state of insight, you have to have this absolute generosity established in your heart. Stinginess does not go with with these qualities. So people who are gone a long way on the path, they are also very generous. So this is the fourth of these uh, principles. The fifth one is as follows. Uh, again, a monk dwells both in public and in private, uh, possessing in common with his companions in the holy life uh, those virtues that are unbroken, uh, untorn, unblotched, uh, unmottled, uh, liberating, commended by the wise, uh, not misapprehended and conducive to uh, stillness, to concentration. Uh, This too is a principle of cordiality that creates a love and respect and conduces to unity. So you are virtuous. Yeah, and the virtues that are talked about here are the standard virtues that are really meant for the Aryans, the noble ones. Uh, unbroken, untorn, unblotched, unmottled virtues it means that they are pure. Yeah, and it's only really the noble ones that have virtue that is that pure, uh, that uh, uh, you never really make, and you, you can still make mistakes, but you undo the mistake very quickly again. Huh? And they are liberating. Yeah, there's one of those beautiful ideas about virtue. Huh? If you sometimes people think that virtue is like imprisoning in you, imprisoning you, uh, and making you having to follow lots of rules and ideas and kind of do things and not really express yourself fully. Huh? But of course, the reality is that even though you are constrained in a certain way, it liberates you in a much deeper sense. It liberates you from the defilements of the mind. It liberates you from remorse. It liberates you from the darkness inside that comes with unrestrained actions. And it makes you bright. It makes you happy. That liberation is far more important and far more meaningful than the tiny liberation that you have from breaking your precepts or whatever. So it's important to understand what is real liberation. Yeah? And then when you get that, then of course you, uh, you understand the power of living morally and living in the right way. Huh? And it is commended by the wise, which is kind of nice. Yeah? It, you don't really want things to be commended by fools, so you're commended by the wise is helpful. Huh? Uh, not misapprehended huh? is actually a wrong translation. Aparamata means not grasped, not attached. Huh? And this is what happens when you become a stream man. You don't attach to the virtue anymore. Why? Because it becomes a natural part of your character. For the rest of us, we have to attach a little bit, and that's okay. It is conducive to samadhi, conducive to stillness. This is the last one here. Yeah. So you practice, uh, uh, again, This uh, one of these things that you see throughout the suttas, again and again and again, uh, this connection between samadhi and virtue. Uh, if your virtue is right, the samadhi will happen as a consequence. It's one of those um, uh, things that uh, you see again and again in various kind of contexts. And this is one of those contexts. And then we have uh, the last one of these six principles. And again, a bhikkhu dwells both in public and in private, uh, possessing in common with his companions in the holy life. That view uh, that is noble and emancipating, uh, in other words, freeing or liberating, uh, and leads one who practices in accordance with it to the complete ending of suffering. Uh, This too is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect uh, and conduces to cohesion, to non-dispute, to concord uh, and to unity. uh. So this is the idea that when you have a common view, a common outlook, then you will tend to live in harmony because you won't dispute anymore. Yeah, and you won't argue about things. And especially when it is, of course, it doesn't mean that if you have different views, you necessarily will argue, but certainly it makes it much easier when you have a similar kind of outlook. And this is kind of the, one of the nice things about having Kalyanamittas. Yeah, we have a, at least sometimes we have a similar outlook. Yeah. Actually, we actually argue a lot as well, don't we, in Buddhism? Sometimes you have Kalyanamittas and you actually still disagree on uh, the meaning of dependent origination and the nature of Nibbana and all these kind of things. Uh, so sometimes you have to put those things to one side and just kind of focus on the practice uh, because uh, sometimes you will never get to an answer by arguing. Uh, some of these things, you'll only be able to understand them through your practice and through, um, uh, through actually achieving these things. And as you do so, they start to become clearer. 
But it's one of the interesting points the Buddha makes in the suttas is that uh, he says that uh, lay people tend to argue over sensual things in the world. Uh, monastics and uh, spiritual people tend to argue over views. Uh, yeah, and you kind of know that's true, isn't it? Uh, once you get into Buddhism, you argue over views. Uh, so please be careful with that. Uh, remember that often it is far more important to just uh, uh, speak in the rice wa- n- nice way, have kindness towards each other. Just leave those views to one side. So often we don't know the answer anyway. Uh, one of the reasons why we argue is precisely because we don't know, uh, because we are attached to the idea, but and because we don't know, we get particularly heated. Uh, if you knew that something was true and somebody argued with you, you would just shrug your shoulders. Yeah, whatever you have your view, I know this happens to be true, so it doesn't matter to me. It's precisely because we don't know that we tend to become even more passionate and heated in arguments. It's kind of interesting, yeah? It's kind of that lack of security and the need to prove our point that often leads to the, these kind of problems. Anyway, there you are. This is how to create unity and uh, Uh, cordiality and uh, harmony in the community and this is the foundation for the entire spiritual path uh, in particular the first three ones uh, which are all about metta and kindness and all of these kind of things uh, and this is really the foundation for everything in the buddhist practice Uh, i was of course as always i was going to go much further than i got uh, but uh, we have another session uh, again this afternoon as well at two o'clock So I think I will stop there because I've been going for almost exactly uh, one hour uh, and then we can continue with this uh, sutta again uh, this afternoon. So I'll see you back at two o'clock.